Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Orthopedics in 2023 and Beyond, Key Trends Affecting Growth and Value-Based Care. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I'm just going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We'll start today's webinar with a presentation, and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions that you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. Secondly, today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. And finally, if at any time you don't see your slides moving or if you have trouble with the audio, just try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're here to help. So with that, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. We have with us Dr. Will Barsoom, the President and Chief Transformation Officer at Healthcare Outcomes Performance Company, or HOPCO. We also have Rena Veris, the President of Value-Based Care Solutions at, at HOPCO, and Donnie Romine the CEO of Southeast Orthopedic Specialist. Dr. Barsoom, Rena, and Donnie, thank you so much again for being here today. And it's my pleasure to go ahead and pass the floor over to Dr. Barsoom to get us kicked off. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present to everybody and to join you uh, today uh, with, uh, with Beckers. So as we all know, musculoskeletal care is a hot topic uh, in healthcare today. Uh, and certainly value-based care in the musculoskeletal uh, space, I think, has become more and more popular over the last uh, several years. So when we think about some of the healthcare challenges, uh, we always like to talk about the solutions associated with them. And, and at HOPCO, we think about uh, the, the continuum of care as almost being pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So whether it's practices, whether it's facilities, whether it's hospitals, payers, all of these can actually work very symbiotically together to solve some of these challenges that we see at the left side of these slides. So if the spend is too high, we want to drive to value. If we want, if we have quality challenge, again, we want to improve quality and drive to value. Uh, we want to look at decreasing costs. We want to think about aligning all of the stakeholders uh, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a healthier way around population health. And then thinking about appropriate partnerships to invest wisely in the next level of, of healthcare transparency and healthcare uh, evolution. I think it's important for folks to recognize that what had been almost considered a little bit of a luxury, thinking about healthcare from a population perspective, is becoming now more and more of a necessity. So we've gone from the historical fee for service uh, system, which, as you know, has led us here in the United States to be spending over four trillion dollars a year on healthcare now right around 20 percent of our gross domestic product while countries around us have actually been much more successful in managing their healthcare spend um, we think about shifting from fee for service and really starting to think about the drivers of change that will lead us to have a more aligned incentive based value based care model around population health so Again, today our fee-for-service model has led to high costs, uh, I would say okay quality. Uh, if we look at, at the U.S. across the board, comparing it to other countries like in Scandinavia, um, uh, France, Italy, uh, and uh, certainly England and Canada, we perform okay. Certainly we're not leaders uh, when it comes to things like um, infant mortality, uh, lifespan, but we do okay. But we spend a lot of money to be okay. We overutilize. We have some of the, the the best technologies, but again, for some of our more primary care uh, and entry level healthcare challenges, we're not really quite as advanced uh, as we could be, and that's because we haven't been aligned around uh, trying to be better when it comes to population health management. When we talk about value-based care, I think it's important to recognize that this catch-all phrase really represents a lot of different things. And we think about it in many ways as a glide path. Um, most folks on the line are, are certainly, I'm sure, uh, comfortable with talking about or understanding 
the whole idea of retrospective procedural bundles. And a lot of folks probably also understand population health, right? The Kaiser model or the Geisinger model. Uh, but there's a lot of steps in between. So, you know, there are clearly some challenges with procedural bundles. Many of many uh, clinicians see these as a race to the bottom. But more importantly, I think when we're when we really are trying to think globally, it's important to recognize that a procedural bundle still necessitates a procedure to occur for any savings and distributions to be realized. So we're actually much bigger fans of of moving further down this glide path as close to population health as we possibly can be. So just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, when it comes to chronic condition bundles, we might be looking at something like osteoarthritis or, or low back pain. And if you combine osteoarthritis and low back pain, those actually together make up about 50% of the musculoskeletal spend in the United States. When we talk about musculoskeletal popula population health, we're talking about taking risk on 26,000 ICD-10 codes, which represent about 30% of all of the ICD-10 codes um, in, the, uh, in the market today. So it really is an evolution for many folks from a mindset perspective, but the further to the right you can get in the value-based care mindset, the greater the opportunity for savings, the greater the opportunity to really improve quality. And I think it's it's important to recognize that this is not necessarily a, a skill set that exists for most healthcare systems today. It certainly exists at a place like Geisinger. I think it exists at, at, place, at a place like, like Kaiser. But for most uh, large healthcare systems even, this is a foreign language. And that's because they've gotten very good at delivering fee-for-service healthcare and to evolve into more of a, of a population health mentality requires a very significant infrastructure to help get us there. So what does some of that kind of look like? Well, clearly, first and foremost, you need a risk infrastructure. You need to start thinking more like an insurance company. How do we take in money? How, how do we spend money? Uh, where should it go? And what are we getting for that investment? Uh, and that takes very real infrastructure. Uh, for example, we utilize our own proprietary claims analytics engine that looks at utilization of various uh, procedures and advanced imaging and specialists, uh, and it bumps it up against national and regional uh, best-in-class uh, goals to give us an idea of how much of an opportunity there actually is to save money. We want to be efficient with all of our episodes. So I... I Personally, I'm a hip and knee replacement surgeon. I want to be thoughtful about how long my patient is in the hospital. Am I using post-acute care appropriately? Um, am I using physical therapy appro appropriately? What is the cost of the implant that I'm choosing to use? Uh, we want appropriate utilization. Are we operating on the right patients? Are we getting MRIs when we need them and not getting them when we don't need them? And then finally, focusing on prevention and wellness to try to remove you know, some of the, uh, the need for very high-end, expensive procedures uh, and expensive uh, uh, imaging, uh, for example. You know, as I mentioned before, one of the challenges with bundles is that to, to actually have any savings, you need an episode. You need a procedure to, to create that. So that's based on first a trigger event, which is usually a decision for surgery, followed by a pre-op workup, the procedure itself, hospital stay, post-acute care, and post-op therapy. So that typical episodic bundle, which many of you are familiar with through CJR or BPCI, um, these have a savings potential. Uh, that savings potential can be significant, but what's really interesting is that the surgical episode itself represents only a small portion of the entire spend for that diagnosis. So as an example, for knee pain, uh, as an example, uh, knee surgery only represents 25% of the total cost of managing knee pain uh, for a, a group of patients. So if you work really hard and you save 10% from the cost of a knee replacement, you've only saved 2.5% of the total cost of spend for knee pain. When we look at lower back pain, it's actually even more significant with lower back pain, for example, the surgery itself only represents 9% of the total spend. So we really do need to start thinking 
broader. So when we think about this, what are the different platforms that might exist to help get us to a point where we are more comfortable taking more risk and thinking more from a value-based care perspective? Uh, so from a practice perspective, value-based care can be what I call the ultimate ancillary because we can layer it on top of fee-for-service rates, which allows the practices to continue to do well from a fee-for-service perspective, but also earn bonuses based on the quality of care that they're providing and the cost of that care. The same thing with hospitals. We actually partner with hospitals to help hospitals reduce their cost of care and improve the quality of their care so that they can also do, they can also earn bonuses from things like a clinically integrated network. So this just kind of gives you a sense <clears throat> of various physician groups, benefit managers, tech-enabled disruptors that are out there, and all of the areas where we look for opportunities to better manage a cohort of patients and a cohort of providers to make sure that our patients are getting the right care in the right setting at the right time by the right provider. So all of these things together allow us to align all parts of the continuum, the provider, the patient, and the payer to ensure the very highest quality of care. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to my partner, Rena Vertez. Rena is our president of Value-Based Care Solutions, and she'll talk about population health and, and really dive into some of the infrastructure needs, uh, certainly more so than I have. Rena? Rena, I think you might be muted. Yep, I am, but I'm not anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Will. And hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit more about value-based care and how we see musculoskeletal being a critical um, component of, of robust value-based care strategies. Um, MSK represents more than 20% of total healthcare spend. It is consistently in the top three categories of spend when payers or employers look at um, how their healthcare dollar is, um, is being spent and more than one out of every two patients in, within a, or I should say members within a population is receiving care for a muscul musculoskeletal diagnosis in any given year. So with that as background, driving value in musculoskeletal care is critical. We believe that the delivery of evidence-based care and being paid for value rather than volume and intensity is the only way to show demonstrable reductions in cost and improvements in quality. We bring these beliefs to our managed practices and to our customers, and that allows us to support growth and market share expansion for ourselves and for our partners. With these inevitable changes, all stakeholders within the healthcare value chain can and should benefit. This includes the patients, the providers, payers, and purchasers of healthcare. The ones who lose are those who fail to recognize or are in denial that the train has already left the station. I wanna share some examples of how we have used value-based care programs focused on musculoskeletal care to drive value and growth. The size and scope of the programs that I'm gonna talk about vary depending on market dynamics and maturity. We push for value-based care components in all of our payer contracts with our managed practices and we also work with payers and other risk-bearing entities to bring broad spectrum value-based care programs to all MSK providers in markets. One such example is a statewide procedural bundle program that we have with Florida Blue. We built a statewide clinically integrated network of musculoskeletal specialists, and we are managing um, the surgical and post-surgical care across those episodes. Initial results have shown savings when we, can, when we actually see for the HOPCO managed network, year over year episode costs have actually declined while for the exact same time period, year over year episode costs for the non-managed network actually saw increases. Improved quality and cost reductions provide value to the patients through better and more equitable healthcare, providers through performance-based incentives that are earned for participation in these programs, and Florida Blue and their customers get to receive the benefit of the lower cost through lower premiums. 
Another example is a statewide musculoskeletal population health management program that we have with United Healthcare in Arizona. In this program, our clinically integrated network takes risk on all care provided for all musculoskeletal diagnoses. And as Dr. Barsoom mentioned um, earlier, we define that in the broadest um, sense possible. That includes um, roughly 26,000 ICD-10 codes that are indicative of musculoskeletal care. And that includes both surgical and non-surgical treatments, as well as care that is delivered by all providers in all settings, as long as it has a musculoskeletal diagnosis. The scope of this type of program um, is, is the broadest that we offer, and I think the broadest that you will find in, um, in, in most um, value-based care discussions and circles. Um, but with that broad scope brings substantial savings potential to the payers and uh, their members and purchasers. And again, because it is so broad in scope, provides robust um, provider engagement. This uh, slide shows the type of results that are achieved under these broad spectrum musculoskeletal population health management programs. They are impressive and they are material. Um, this shows the results we achieved um, in an earlier program that covered about 100,000 Medicare Advantage lives and generated over $30 million in annual run rate savings. You can see from this graph, we literally were able to take um, trends in musculoskeletal spend prior to the launch of the program that were um, in double digits and increasing and bring those trends down to a point where they were actually negative year over year. And this was all achieved over the course of a two year time frame. Quality improved during this time. Providers were fully engaged, earned meaningful um, incentive bonuses, and uh, it was just a win-win across the board. Value-based care programs related to musculoskeletal care measurably improve quality and cost. Given the breadth of musculoskeletal care provided to patients across all settings, we're talking primary care settings, emergency rooms, facilities, labs, et cetera, value-based care programs can be used to ensure medically appropriate care is delivered to patients in the most cost-effective settings. Whether these programs are narrow scope, like a professional fee capitation, or the most comprehensive scope um, that is seen in a musculoskeletal population health program, the opportunities for quality and efficiency improvement exist and results have been achieved. We have had success moving high value care networks to consistent use of evidence-based care pathways, which results in predictable and material savings across all musculoskeletal value-based care programs. And you can see some examples here of um, professional fee, um, uh, population health, as well as um, procedural bundle programs. In order to do this, we need a robust analytics infrastructure, not only to, um, to just manage the overall program, but to, ac um, to accurately price the risk and ensure that we are um, on track. <clears throat> we use claims data as well as data sources um, like uh, EMR and other data that we can, receive, we can obtain from our practices and from our um, risk clients to establish targets identify specific and actionable quality improvement and cost reduction opportunities, monitor progress, identify outliers, engage actively with the network, and generate results. This data-driven approach allows us to manage a process of continuous improvement over time. Our infrastructure is supported by a team of actuaries, data scientists, clinical informatics ex experts, as well as um, clinicians who are able to all work together to combine um, these various sources of data, looking at things through a financial and clinical lens to identify opportunities and um, drive performance improvement. Turning data into actionable strategies and tactics requires the ability to break down musculoskeletal spend into detailed functional areas and categories of spend. 
This allows us to then drill down by provider and facility to identify variation and develop specific approaches for each area. Our model is data-driven, supplemented by clinical and financial experts who work directly with the provider network to understand root cause issues and implement targeted solutions to alleviate those root causes. We don't stop at identifying what the problem is. We start asking the questions once we've seen that there's a problem. We ask why, we ask how it can be corrected. We then um, boots on the ground, work with the network to actually remove any barriers to ensure that the, um, the root cause issues are addressed and, um, and barriers removed. Hold on, fast forwarded too much, sorry about that. There we go. Um, we have a variety of tools that allow us to break down results for each fun functional area by utilization, cost, and quality. Our robust data warehouse is used to develop clinical and financial benchmarks, which when we compare to the claims drill down that we've created um, in, our, in our analytics platforms, allow us to see where efficiency and quality improvement opportunities exist and what the value of improving those outcomes is. This type of analysis is done for every population and network that we manage. And as I was saying earlier, it's not enough to just identify that emergency room visits are up. We're looking at um, where that's happening. Is it isolated to certain parts of the network? Why is it happening? What's the value of driving that, um, that improvement and, and then implementing the strategies to do so? Active management combined with data and real-time feedback allows us to create sustainable behavior change. The data insights are used by boots on the ground network managers who meet with physicians and administrators to review results, discuss outliers and barriers to performance achievement. Our clinical experts work with the network to implement standardized care pathways and order sets. We provide education through webinars and quality committees as well as peer-to-peer -peer coaching with nationally recognized musculoskeletal experts like Dr. Barsoom. Physician scorecards provide feedback on performance relative to specific quality and efficiency measures that are all tied to incentives. Our technology platform provides user-friendly analytics on utilization and cost patterns, as well as quality and compliance tracking. We use these dashboards and tools to identify broad, as well as specific patterns that are impacting results. We review these patterns of variation in care to um, set targets for our network and to focus our network management and clinical outreach on the right providers to ensure that we are getting um, the right outcomes. We have remote care management capabilities that allow us to actively monitor patients throughout their surgical episode of care journey, ensuring that both sur that surgical and post-surgical care and sites of service are optimized. Healthcare is changing. Patients want to be connected to their providers and they want personalized care. To take care of our patients and our value-based care lives better, we have a digital ecosystem that powers care delivery and our value-based programs. Our digital platform allows for robust patient and provider engagement and monitoring. Working with care providers, we deploy digital tools that provide patient engagement and coaching and promote decision-making and decision support. Patient reported outcomes are tracked and monitored to allow for quality reporting, early alert to potential complications and triage for patients who are not showing expected improvement. Patient adherence to treatment plans is, is enhanced 
through virtual and home-based physical therapy options, and patient adoption is high due to the personalized nature of the application and care team connectivity. We actually design our applications to, with the patient and the provider partnership in mind. The patient um, perceives all of this as being delivered directly by their own provider with whom they have a personal relationship and are looking to, um, to, to, to obey, for lack of a better word, and com comply is probably better um, with, with the treatment plans that their provider is, um, is ordering. And with that, I'm gonna hand you off to my colleague, Donnie Romine, who leads our Southeast Orthopedic Specialist practice. Thanks, Rena. Let me get the slides here. So I'm going to start off just kind of <clears throat> setting the setting the stage of, of who Southeast Orthopedic Specialist was prior to our partnership with Hopco and then and then and then where we've gone since that time. So if you go back to 2018, which was the year, the, the, the last year uh, before we did our partnership with uh, Hopco, which was in the middle of 2019. So we're just about next month we're going to be at the four year mark. But uh, the the practice was established in 2001. It was what I would call a, maybe a medium sized uh, orthopedic surgery practice. Uh, very much focused on, uh, you know, orthopedic surgery, uh, very focused on, on, on all the subspecialties. Uh, we had a couple good um, uh, um, uh, ancillaries. We had, uh, you know, a few locations and, and during that, or right about that, in that 2018 uh, time period, um, the owners of the practice kind of got together and we started asking the question, where do we go from here? We have a good practice, but what do we want to do going forward? And I think the main thing that, that uh, th these are kind of were the main drivers to our desired future state, and that was number one. How do we transition from an orthopedic surgery practice to a musculoskeletal healthcare system? We had a lot of conversations about the fact that the vast majority of people who are out there who need orthopedic or musculoskeletal care don't need surgery. Uh, they need something else. And how can we be uh, the company that provides that something else? So how do we offer that full continuum of, of MSK services? Next is how do we create an operating model that's scalable? Um, you know, we were relatively, had a relatively small footprint and we wanted to grow that footprint to outside. We were actually only in two counties. Our, our, our primary service uh, area uh, in Northeast Florida is a, is a five county area. We were in two, but we wanted to expand that all the way down into central Florida and then all the way across the panhandle uh, uh, over to uh, even in, in, into kind of the Pensacola area and areas like that. So we knew we needed something scalable. The next one was the kind of a conversation around, we know that the transition from, from volume to value is coming. And we had to kind of make a decision. Do we want to be, we, we knew the train was coming. And, and do we want to be driving the train or do we want to be a passenger on the train or do we want to be run over by the train? And, and, we, and, and we decided we wanted to be, you know, in, in the driving the train. We may not know how to build the train, but we knew we wanted to be driving it. And that's where the, the, the conversations came about, about, well, maybe we need a partner in this. And of course, uh, being the aggressive people, type A's that we are, we wanted to, to create this market dominant organization that, uh, that nobody would be able to compete with. So moving forward, and this is kind of, and, and I put this on here, I don't, I'm not gonna read all the way through it. There's a lot of words on here, but I wanted to just kind of give that, that, that impression from 2019 till now over the last four years, this is just a listing of the things that we have done with our Hopco partnership, and it's a lot. Uh, and, and you'll see at the end of my presentation a lot of the results that we've achieved through that. But there are a couple of things on here that I do want to kind of stress and point out. Uh, that's going to be kind of the kind of maybe, maybe a, the theme to to what I'm going to talk about. One is if you look on that top left where it says added specialties. Um, uh, we added things like chiropractic. We added, we did not have pain management at the time. We added pain management. We added a lot of non-operative orthopedics. So this was us moving into the non-operative side of the, of the business and, 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 and going away from just a pure 
surgical practice. That actually connects with, if you look on the right hand side on the on the on the top, uh, where we where we talk about uh, walk in clinics. So we we have put together what we call a, a hub and spoke model. I know that's not that's nothing unique uh, to us, uh, but but what we've really focused on getting our access points out into the communities, out where people live. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, our partnerships, bottom left-hand corner. Um, and uh, you see on there the hospital service line management piece. Our uh, partnership with the hospital system here in Jacksonville is critical. Uh, it's critical for us and it's critical for them and it's critical for Hopco. Well, we have formed a really, really strong partnership. And then the the last one, and this actually connects all of it together, is the, the enhanced market presence. That's something Hopco brought to the table for us. And we have really created a strong presence, whether it's our uh, presence through our website, presence through social media, you know, our digital marketing strategy. We have a lot of things that, that go into all that. So, so I'm going to hit on those kind of as we go forward. So, so this one, I'm going to start with um, our, our, our partnership with Ascension Florida and Gulf Coast. So that's uh, uh, a, a system of hospitals. There are eight hospitals now that go from Jacksonville across to Pensacola. I'm going to focus on the east side of that market, the Jacksonville uh, market, which is St. Vincent's Healthcare. One of the th one of the things that we did with 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 um, with Ascension is we we formed or put together this uh, uh, orthopedic uh, specialty hospital. It's not a standalone facility. It's a facility. It's a hospital within a hospital. Uh, but it is branded uh, Performance Orthopedic and Spine Specialty Hospital. So when people come in, uh, one of the Ascension hospitals, they come into our entrance. And that, what you can see on the slide there, uh, is actually the entrance to, to our facility. And, and, it, and the, the key to that is, it is what's driving this partnership with, uh, with Ascension. So um, the... A very important. In fact, I, I was just looking at some some IntelliMed data that I just got. So I want to kind of give you. I'll just kind of give you some of the some of the results that we've achieved in here, and it, but I'll set the stage as well. Jacksonville is a pretty competitive market. We have 15 hospitals in our primary service area, um, and that's anywhere from four Ascension hospitals, five Baptist Health hospitals, a couple HCA hospitals, two U, uh, uh, University of Florida Health hospitals. Uh, there's a uh, locally owned hospital in St. Augustine, just south of us. And then we also have Mayo. Uh, so we have some pretty competitive uh, uh, areas out there. And in the last IntelliMed, with the last IntelliMed data that we just got, uh, we have moved five market share points uh, to Ascension over the last four quarters. Uh, and, and it may not sound like a lot, uh, but as competitive as that market is, uh, we've gone from from Ascension having a 28% share of the market to a 33% share of the market. And that's equivalent of, of somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 surgical cases a year. So it is really significant. And how we've done that is there's, there's just a lot of things that we've done. One uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the performance sort of peak and spine uh, specialty hospital. Through our joint venture with, with Hopco and with Ascension, we really focus on things, not just the volume, but the quality. And, and so our surgeons and, and, and the Hopco team, Hopco actually has a team here in the market that, that focuses on this service line. And we come together on a regular basis and we manage the service line for Ascension. And so that's what's driving that, 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 that shift in the market. But again, it's not just the volume, it's also we focus on quality. And we focus on things like, you know, uh, first case out on time starts. We look at things like our HCAP scores around communication with the physician. Uh, we, we have a trauma program that we've developed with Ascension where we, one of the metrics we track is, is what percentage of the patients who come into the ER with a hip fracture are in the OR within 24 hours. Uh, you know, what's our 30 day readmission rate? Just all kinds of things like that. And we have driven the quality metrics beyond what anybody else in the market uh, has been able uh, has been able to do. So uh, so that that connection has been very, uh, very important to us on the southeast orthopedic side. That partnership is important uh, because we are connected to to that to Ascension 
and we're able to use that that partnership to grow. And whether it's uh, referrals from uh, from Ascension uh, primary care physicians or recruitment agreements that 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 Ascension provides us that allows us to go out uh, and 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 add uh, 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 providers to our to our team. Uh, something that uh, and I think I've got this is kind of what 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 that has resulted in. And you and remember if you if you can remember from the from the slide that I showed earlier. Um, we were 60 providers uh, at that time. Uh, and and in, in, in just over those last four years, and this is again through a lot of combination of HOPCO work, SOS work, uh, Ascension work, we're now a group of 120 providers. So just in those four years, we have doubled the size of our, of our practice. We've added 60 providers, we've added 10 surgeons, we've added six non-operative physicians, we've added 15 uh, APPs, we've added 29 therapists, we've added five clinic locations, and we've added two surgery centers. Uh, and that growth hasn't, hasn't even stopped yet. We, we still have line of sight for, for more uh, significant growth on top of that. This is our market coverage. Uh, at th this was SOS in 2018. Five clinics had a you know, relatively uh, decent coverage uh, around the Jacksonville market, but nothing really significant. So fast forward to now, and you can see that our coverage area is, is significantly greater. Uh, we've implemented, again, this hub and spoke model uh, where we're able to put our smaller, what we call spoke clinics. And our spoke clinics are focused on non-operative. We have a non-operative uh, orthopedist. Uh, we have a chiropractor and we have, some of them have uh, advanced imaging, most do not. Uh, but then we also have therapy uh, in each of those locations. And using some of the tools of, from Hopco, we were able to sit down and look at where these, these new clinics needed to be located. So we do, we, we run heat maps and we're able to see where is it that we have maybe holes in our market capture. Uh, and, and because we don't have anything in that, you know, maybe a densely populated part of the, of the market that we weren't physically located in or Maybe it was a situation of we had a, an area of the market that we had a lot of market capture and we needed to protect it. Uh, so, so we're able to start building these smaller, our typical, what we call our hub clinics are anywhere from 15 to 25,000 square feet. Um, that's where the surgeons hang out. We have advanced imaging. We have all those kind of things there. We have our pain management, our, you know, uh, at, you know we do kyfo there, uh, all those kind of things. And the, the scaled down clinics, those were kind of, those, they're kind of neighborhood clinics. And so, and the key to those, we hold those out to the community as, here's a place that's close to home. You can walk in if you'd like. Uh, if you'd like an appointment, that's fine too. Uh, we'll, we, we will see you within 24 hours. And what we have found, at least in this market, we transformed from a market of people being used to, I call the practice and I have to wait three or four weeks to get in to see somebody because everybody's so busy uh, to we'll see you within 24 hours. Uh, and, and, and it has really made a big difference for us. And this is part of how we've done that. Um, the, the team at Hopco, the marketing team at Hopco has help, uh, helped us to brand uh, the, these spoke clinics. And we call this um, uh, SOS Direct or Southeast Orthopedic Specialist Direct. Uh, and all of our spoke clinics are branded uh, with this. A lot of collateral material. We have, did, we have uh, uh, videos that we use in some of our digital advertising. Um, and, and again, this has been a real uh, thrust of ours. And again, in a little bit, I'll show you uh, the results of, of, of this. Uh, so we have grown through, through all of these initiatives. We have grown um, the the not only the, the footprint of Southeast Orthopedics, but we've also just grown the volume of orthopedics. And I know it, it kind of sounds counterintuitive when we talk about going to value. Um, you know, why do you focus so much on growth? And again, I think this goes back to, we knew that there was a lot of market in, in our market, a lot of patients in our market that were not accessing us. Uh, and they may, be, may have been accessing our competitors uh, or, or just or leaving town. So we wanted to make it that access point where they could come in to see, to see us. But then also, and you'll see when we start showing some of these results, um, 
the, the patients are not that are coming in are getting the right care at the right time. So for example, you can see here uh, in 2018, our practice, we, 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 we had 18,000 new patients in our practice in that year. And we did 9,600 surgeries. So you see that, that, that surgical conversion rate. Um, fast forward to 2022, six, we, we saw 64,000 new patients uh, in our practice uh, and, and so over, you know, a 37% uh, year over year uh, compound annual growth rate, uh, I, I think any business would, would, would almost kill for that, for that kind of a growth rate. But you can see our surgery growth rate was only eight and a half percent. So the, pe the people that we're bringing in are getting the, the, a, a, a getting non-operative care uh, as opposed to just, you know, going, somebody going straight to surgery. So our clinic visits, have gone from in 2018, 161,000 visits to 246,000 visits um, uh, last year. Um, I, I saw a question on there uh, earlier about uh, ancillaries. We have a real focus on our ancillaries. You can see uh, we've gone from, in 2018, we had one MRI and we did uh, 4,600 MRIs. Right now we have four, uh, four MRIs. We did 14,000 last year. We're on target actually to do 23,000 uh, MRIs this year with our same uh, four. Two of those four we acquired in, at the, in the middle of 2021. We'll be adding a fifth MRI uh, uh, later this year, early next year. We're not sure which uh, we'll end up doing. Uh, DME, same thing. Uh, therapy, you can see what, what's happened with our therapy uh, uh, volume from 46,000 visits uh, in 2018 to 92,000 visits in 22. I think we'll hit 124,000 visits this year. Um, we actually produce about, or we order about 62,000 therapy uh, evals uh, every year, and uh, which generate about 500,000 therapy visits. Our, 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 I wish we had the capacity to keep all those in house. We don't. We keep adding capacity, um, and so uh, that that's a real focus of ours. Again, with the help of Hopco, how do we add capacity? And, and how do we grow and add these rehab centers that we're, that we're developing around the city? Uh, one of the things that we Im implemented was uh, in-house suspensing. Uh, again, to that question that came up about utilization of, of ancillaries, one of the things that we do with our, we have a team of, it's called our growth team, and, and, and their job is to identify what are things that we order for, out of our practice that goes outside. So that's when. So with that, we've expanded our DME. We've added in-house dispensing. We've added in-house kyphoplasty. We're in the process of adding uh, remote uh, patient monitoring uh, to enhance our our, our PT. Um, and so all of this has resulted in a pretty significant growth in in the in the practice. You can see from 39 million uh, in AR collections to 72 million last year. I think this year we'll we'll end up doing about 87, 88 million. Uh, and, and so, again, talk, we talked about glide paths earlier. We're on that glide path to continue uh, to grow. Very healthy organization. And, I, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work, but I don't think we would have come anywhere close to these results and these numbers without our, uh, our HOPCO and our Ascension partnerships. Uh, so those, those have really helped us um, tremendously, tr tremendously. So... Uh, that's kind of us uh, in a uh, in a nutshell in uh, at four, four years and 15 minutes. And uh, so uh, I, we're available now to answer any questions that anybody may have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Barsoom, Rena, and Donnie. Really great presentation. And I know this topic is so top of mind for so many out there. So really helpful information for us all. So let's go ahead and get started with the Q&A session. And just a reminder to the audience members, you can submit any questions that you have by typing them into the Q&A chat box. It's on your webinar console. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Um, this one, I'm thinking, Rena, you might be best suited for this question, which is, what are the primary drivers to reduce cost trend? So examples given are utilization, pre-op preventive therapies, reimbursement terms. Um, sure, and thanks for the question. Um, so the the drivers of savings and opportunity 
do vary in each market depending on a, a variety of, of factors. But in general, and you know, related to some of the results that, uh, that I showed in earlier slides, um, we see savings across a variety of levers. It's not just one single lever. Um, we are looking, uh, we're seeing savings in uh, appropriateness of just services being provided. And that includes um, a service happening at all. Like, um, you know, maybe, maybe a surgery is not warranted or an MRI is not warranted but also the number of services being provided. So for example, let's say a patient is, um, is referred for physical therapy and that's you know, clinically appropriate, but what may not be clinically um, appropriate is 21 appointments versus let's say 10 or 14. So um, you know, we're looking at it in, from all of those lenses. Um, site of service is definitely a lever that's pulled. It is a bigger opportunity in some markets compared to others, not only in the intensity, but also you know, among facilities within the same, um, the same category. Um, Post-acute is, is another big um, area of opportunity still, um, just, just unnecessary use of, of um, various post-discharge um, services. So clinical appropriateness and, um, and you know, service intensity are, are really where we're finding the most savings opportunity. Rina, can I, can I, can I, I add, add to that, Rina? To that? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Will and I both, go ahead, Will. Uh, th thanks, Donnie. Yeah, so what I was gonna suggest as well is, um, I think it's important to recognize, many times people think about um, cost savings in the orthopedic surgery space and they immediately link it to less surgery. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. It's, it's actually appropriate surgery at the, at the right time, at the right place. And I'll give you an example. As a, as a knee and hip replacement surgeon, if I see a patient that needs a knee replacement and they have a 30 degree flexion contracture and a fixed varus deformity, I know that there isn't enough physical therapy in the world that's going to keep them from getting a knee replacement. I know that. In our protocols, you actually should operate on that patient right away. You shouldn't send them to therapy. You shouldn't inject their knee because we know it's not going to make any difference. Our programs also reach into the primary care space where we work with our colleagues in primary care uh, that are involved in the, in the uh, uh, regions where we have networks. And we ask them to work with us around things like advanced imaging. So another example would be we published a paper not too long ago that showed that uh, almost 50% of patients coming for a knee replacement already had an MRI that was ordered by somebody other than the orthopedic surgeon. These patients come in and they say, well, do you want to look at my MRI? And I candidly, I'll look at it just to make them feel better, but I don't need to look at it because their X-ray tells the story. I didn't, the MRI was completely unnecessary. So the idea of, of, of educating providers more around clinical care pathways is really a great way to A, improve communication between providers and b make sure that the patient gets that that correct care uh right on the uh, on the front side of it Donnie? yeah it, it and what i was going to say is very similar to all that and i and, and and maybe kind of at the from the practice perspective and i think kind of our mantra on that is it's it's all about what do you, what you do when you do it and where you do it and and so we try to look at the what is, what is what are we doing is this this uh, again this is not a orthopedic surgery practice anymore we do a lot of surgeries we do now you know 15,000 surgeries but we see a whole lot of patients who don't ever need surgery but to that point and i think we, and will said this i think great the, the, the he really said it really well we use the the hopco tools that we have to identify if a patient needs to go to the or go to the or and I think the payers have a tendency to say, well, you need to go through all this conservative therapy, you need to have this, you need to have this, you need to have so many PT visits and all that. But like Will said, the surgeon knows, what, they're going to surgery anyway because they need surgery. So why don't we just skip all that and go and fix them? In the OR, that's actually gonna drive down the cost to the payer. And then the last thing is where you do it. And that's, you know, we, I, I, I think uh, four years ago, maybe 15 to 20 percent of our of our surgical cases were done in an ASC. I think now we're at about uh, 45 percent. And uh, and the only reason it's not at 75 percent, which is our goal, uh, is because we don't have enough 
uh, ASC capacity. We have nine ORs that we are that we own. Uh, over the next 18 months, we're going to be either building or buying or expanding to 19. Uh, and, and, and with that, we can get that hit that 75% mark. So all those things combined, and I think Rena said it as well, there's no one thing. It's just a lot of things that are that drive down that cost. Great. Thank you all for that really well-rounded answer. Okay, so this next question is for Dr. Barsoom. The question is, is shifting TJR to outpatient contributing to higher quality and lower costs? Yeah, that's a great question. So th there's no question that it does. In fact, you know, if, if you, just the folks on this webinar, if you ask yourself or if you've ever taken a family member or you yourself have, have had surgery in a hospital setting versus in a surgery setting, that alone tells you that the patient experience is so much better pretty much across the board in a surgery center. Parking is easier. You don't have to uh, uh, pay to go into a parking garage. Um, you don't have to trek you know, blocks to get to the right desk to get checked in for your surgery. It's just very, very simple. It's very straightforward. Um, you can arrive a little bit later. You usually leave a little bit earlier. Um, all those things certainly make the patient experience uh, a lot better. Now, that being said, not every patient is appropriate for the outpatient space, but all things being equal, if you had the choice, most folks would choose uh, having it done in an ASC because the experience tends to be better. Now, in terms of cost, there's no question that the cost is lower in an ASC. Not only is the reimbursement lower, but the actual costs are lower. Why? Um, I used to run hospitals before I joined Hopco. I was CEO of the Cleveland Clinic for uh, the Florida region. And when I did that, uh, our hospitals needed anesthesiologists in-house 24 hours a day. We needed general surgery residents in-house 24 hours a day because we had really sick patients that needed to be managed 24 hours a day. In an ASC setting, you don't need those folks. You don't need an anesthesiologist spending the night in an ASD not generating any revenue, right? So that's that's a pure cost that isn't necessary in a surgery center that is necessary in a hospital. So there are very direct costs associated with running hospitals that you don't have in ASCs. In addition, um, even just the cost of construction. In the state of Florida, where Donnie and I both live, we have ACA, which is essentially our Department of Health. It's a wonderful group, and, they, and they, they, they do a very nice job here within the state. But the requirements for uh, construction codes for a hospital are very different than construction codes for an ASC. So the cost of building the same, essentially the same facility, if it's hospital-based versus if it's an ASC, are dramatically different because of those requirements. So hopefully that helps to answer the question around cost. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Barsoom. I think this question would be best suited for you as well. Um, is there a strategy to build a narrow, high-performing network of post-acute providers that also take risk and gain share? Yeah, I mean, look, I think in the ideal state, yes, without a question. I mean, working with, well, when, when you're getting into rehab facilities and subacute nursing facilities and home health care uh, organizations, Without a doubt, we have partners that we work with, uh, and uh, and in essence, their motivation is is um, is that we share with them our best practices. They're willing to utilize those best practices, um, and it works out very well with patients. So they end up getting some patient steerage because they develop a reputation for being the best in class provider and potentially a reputation of being you know the hot go partner in that region. So that's a that's a real benefit I think to them. And clearly a benefit to us to have uh, a post-acute care uh, provider partner that we believe is, is best in class. So there's no question that, that further alignment and, and, and kind of vertical integration around post-acute care plays a, a very important role here. And you know, it, it's somewhat subtle in some of the things that you see that make a post-acute site um, best in class. Uh, I would say it could be from, it can range from how much therapy patients are getting. What are the protocols that the patients are utilizing? How long are the patients staying at that site versus being discharged, right? That's a big one. 
um, just because your insurance company will pay for 21 days of post-acute care as an inpatient doesn't mean that you need 21 days of post-acute care as an inpatient. So uh, again, you know, working with our with our partners there to ensure that their beds are best utilized by patients that need those beds uh, is a win-win for them. It's a win-win for our patients and, and a win-win for society from a cost savings perspective. Great, thank you so much. And Dr. Barsoom, I promise I will give you a break in just a moment and I'll kick over some other questions to Rena and Donnie, but I have one more for you as we're sure. winding down. Um, what is the first thing an MSK practice should look for in a PE or MSO partner? Well, I'll give you my answer, and then I'll ask Donnie to weigh in because he was on the he was he was on the end of of thinking about things. Um, I would I'll give you the first ten reasons in one word: culture. Um, the the any partner that you bring into a practice, whether it is a partner that's an orthopedic surgery partner. Right. As an orthopedic surgeon, I was when I looked for partners, I wanted to be I wanted them to be culturally aligned with me and with the other members of my department as an organization. You know, whether it's a practice or on our side, whether it's a practice management platform, uh, a musculoskeletal management platform, whoever you're partnering with needs to be culturally aligned with you. And we do the same thing, by the way, with hospitals. Um, if we meet with a hospital whose view it is that all orthopedic volume, all MSK volume should stay in their hospital and should not, then they don't want to develop an outpatient strategy around MSK care. That's not a good partner for us because we recognize that in the end, we're not going to have aligned priorities and aligned goals. So having that cultural alignment around how do you reduce costs? How do you improve quality? How do you make it best in class for patients and improve the quality of care? That's, I think, really the key, and that all comes down to, to culture. Donnie, what, what were you guys thinking about at SOS as you guys were thinking, of, you know, looking for the right partner? Yeah, thanks, Will. It was really the same thing. <clears throat> um, we we went through, and you know, we interviewed several bankers. We met with several PE firms, and I and I and I think every time, without fail, every time we finished a meeting with them, it, it just didn't feel right. And I think the I think the thing that struck us the most is, it, it, like Will, I mean, I, I come out of the the hospital side, you know, running hospitals as I, I, you know, hospital CFO, CEO, COO for for thirty years. And what I found is, I found myself sitting in front of a group of people that had no clue what I do every day, and had no clue what our physicians do every day. And, and after the fourth or fifth one said, you know, introduce himself as I'm whoever, and I have 28 years of healthcare experience, um, I found myself responding with, no, you actually have zero years of healthcare experience because you don't have any idea what I do. And, 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 and so we, we were kind of discouraged uh, as we looked at that. And then when we sat down with Hopgo, that all changed because with Hopgo, it was, you, we weren't I have, you know, Hopco may have private equity backing. The four years that I've been with Hopco, I've never talked to a private equity person one. And uh, I, I talked to Rena, and I talked to Will, and I talked to uh, David Jakovsky. And you know, and my my, I have two boards that I report to. One is the board of Southeast Orthopedic Specialists, which is five orthopedic surgeons. The other is the board of our MSO. And that board is eight people, seven of who are orthopedic surgeons. Will happens to be one. And, and so it's the, that, that culture piece is there, like Will said, because everybody has been to the same place and everybody does the same things and we think the same way. So it was a very easy decision for us once we finally found the right partner. And it was literally that night after the presentation that we had with with uh, with Hopco, the decision was made that night. It was that clear to us that this is the way we needed to go. Great, thank you so much. And I know we are right down to the wire, but I think we can squeeze in just one more question uh, for you, Rena. 
The last question is, what is Hopco doing to reduce duplication of services and enhance collaboration among all players leading up to care delivery and post-care delivery? Another great question. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, as we as we said earlier, we are our platform is designed around both the a digital um, infrastructure as well as a deployment of care pathways and protocols that are all aligned around the delivery of evidence based care. Um, those. In order for clinicians to participate in our clinically integrated networks, they are basically agreeing to comply with those care pathways, um, which, you know, by the very nature of it is, is you know, ensuring that they're only doing things that are necessary um, one time and in, in, in the right setting and at the right time. We also work um, we directly, as well as our clinically integrated network of specialists work with upstream and downstream providers, whether it's the primary care physicians and the ER physicians upstream, or the skilled nursing facility and, and home health agencies downstream. We are working with them to educate them as well on appropriate clinical care as related to musculoskeletal conditions. So we are, we are working, we have, um, programs to educate primary care physicians on the appropriate treatment of patients, for example, with low back pain. When is it appropriate to refer? When is it appropriate to order an MRI? When is it appropriate to, um, to prescribe opioids? And in all of those things and those, and those um, algorithms to make uh, good clinical decisions are, are deployed throughout the entire care continuum to ensure that everyone is uh, is complying and and thus minimizing any real duplication and waste. Wonderful, thanks, Rena. Thanks especially for addressing that question um, in such a condensed period of time. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Barsoom, Rena, and Donnie for your excellent presentations today, and also to our audience for your engagement and the excellent questions. And lastly, we'd like to thank Hopco for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content presented today, please be sure to check out the resources section of your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you all again so much for joining, and we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.